Good morning. Today we're going to look at part two of the Lord's Prayer. Now prayer is so important in our lives. The purpose of this series is to look at the words of this particular prayer and examine the intent behind the words. Being articulate with your words is not as critical as simply opening your heart to God. God did this for us first. God poured out his heart that we might know him. So why did God create us? Why are we here? The short answer is for his pleasure. Revelations 4.11 says, You are worthy, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. God is a personal being, and it gives him pleasure to have a genuine relationship with us, his children. When he made the universe, he did what pleased himself, and since God is perfect, his action was perfect, and it was very good. Genesis 1, 31, God made, saw everything that he made, and indeed it was very good, and there was evening and morning the sixth day. Being made in the image of God, human beings have the ability to know God, and love him, and worship him, and serve him, and fellowship with him. God didn't create human beings as because he needed them. As God, he needs nothing. But he is open to anyone who is open to him. So we're going to look at the first part of the Lord's Prayer, Your Kingdom Come, Your your. We are God's creation. We are God's people. And we should be God-centered. It doesn't mean that we can't live. God desires us to be lived, to be fruitful, and to enjoy life in a good way. We are to live together in this world. The problem is our human nature is to be self-centered. And this COVID-19 has only made the problem worse. A new study indicates that increased perception of social isolation or a heightened degree of self-centeredness can feed off one another to create an uptick in both loneliness and self-centered. Or in other words, loneliness makes us more self-centered and being more self-centered makes us more lonely. It's a downward spiral. This feedback loop has the potential to snowball out of control as we get older. Social media, while it pretends to, to connect us to others, may actually lead to greater self-centeredness. Much of social media is all about me. Smaller families and over-doting helicopter parents may also be creating greater narcissism in children. And finally, society, with its emphasis on celebrity, appearance, and perfection, may be playing a part in the rise of self-centeredness. In a statement to the University of Chicago, John Casipio said, if you get more self-centered, you run the risk of staying locked into feeling socially isolated. Human beings became powerful in large part due to mutual aid and protection. He is saying that in prior days, we had to work together to help each other survive. When we don't have mutual aid and protection, we are more likely to become focused on our own interest and our own welfare. That is, we become more self-centered. The good news is that curtailing self-centeredness may create an upward spiral, spiral that simulates, simultaneously reduces loneliness and increasing our social connectedness. The cycle can be turned around. John heralds the findings of his latest study as a call to action. He says, now we know loneliness is damaging and contributing to the misery and health care healthcare costs of America. How do we 
how do we replace it or how do we reduce our self-centeredness? From a public health perspective, reducing our self-centeredness and loneliness is of paramount importance. The big question is, how do we reduce self-centeredness? How would we do that? So by helping other people, correct. Get out of yourself and look at the needs of others. Look at what God has done to help us out of ourselves. God sent Moses to free the Hebrews from the Egyptians. God sent prophets to make a way for his Messiah. And God sent Jesus to offer us a way to get out of ourselves. Romans 5, 7 through 8, rarely will a person die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This is the ultimate example of giving all for us. For you and me, that we might enter the kingdom of God. Note, the your in the your kingdom come is not a singular your, like, or not a singular your, it is a community of believing, thinking people acting as one in the spirit. Just as the Our Father reminds us that God is there for everyone, it's just not my Father, it's our Father, your kingdom come reminds us that God's kingdom is for all, for anyone who wants to be there. Your kingdom come. Matthew 6.33 tells us, Strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. We have an opportunity to bring more people into the kingdom. Our actions in reaching out to others to show how important the kingdom is to us and how we much we care about others will be an invitation for them to join the kingdom. Matthew 23, this is, this is the story when the lawyer came and asked about uh, which commandment is the greatest. And Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment, and second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Loving our neighbor is so important or is as important as loving ourselves. Both are needed to make us whole. But how do we love our neighbor? Well, I'm, I'm in the Kairos prison ministry. When, when I started in the Kairos prison ministry, a friend invited me to join him at the first Kairos meeting. So I was going to meet the friend at the meeting. So I, when I got to the meeting, the friend didn't show up. So here I am, walking into this great big room full of old gentlemen, very intimidating, not knowing anybody. Immediately, though, that group helped me to feel welcome. They worked hard to help me know what was expected in the Kairos program and the boundaries and the rules. I needed to know all of that to know what Kairos was about. But it is a very fulfilling ministry then. So how can we love our neighbor? By helping them understand God's kingdom, God's family, the expectations and the boundaries and the rules. We can help that happen. God intends for all people, all nations, to have the opportunity to decide if they want to partake in the kingdom. The question is, who will be in the kingdom because of our words, our actions, and our prayers? Your kingdom come, your will be done. So what is God's will? Jesus said in Luke 22, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. 
Christ's entire life on earth was here for one purpose. To give his life that we might be allowed to join the kingdom. God desires that all come to salvation so much that he sent his son. And that's best expressed in John 3.16. You've probably heard this one before. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that everyone who believes in him may not perish but may have eternal life. And it's further clarified in the next verse. God doesn't want us to be miserable. God wants to relate with us. John 3.17. Indeed, God didn't send the God. God didn't send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Then in 1 Timothy 2.3, this is right and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires everyone to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. The hope is that each and every person would have the opportunity to see God in our lives and decide for themselves if they want to be joined with him. That those who are willing would be given that opportunity. Second Peter, Peter 3 9 says, The Lord is not slow about his promises, some think of slowness, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a loud noise, and the elements will be dissolved with fire, and the earth and everything in it will be disclosed. Our time here is limited. Not my will, but thy will be done. The ultimate point we need to reach in our spiritual growth is that we be one with God's will. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. John 17, 22 says, The glory that you have given me, I have given them so that they may be one as we are one. Jesus means for us to be one with him right here, right now, today, on this earth. God's will on earth can be accomplished today in our hearts and actions. In time, Jesus will return to earth and bring God's holiness to it, and we will return with him. Jesus will then rule the earth in holiness for a thousand years, and after that, all will come to the judgment and those that reject God will be rejected. Then God's children will enter into eternity with our Lord. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Everyone in heaven knows the beauty of being one with God. I think of it as being like the ultimate marriage. Fun, fulfilling, growing, stable, secure. Just now it may not seem like God is winning, but we don't see what God sees. And God is not trying to ruin people's day by hitting them over the head with a club. He is offering a community of relationship, of trust, of stability, and even of fun where we can live together in life-giving peace. And that leads us to some of Jesus' final words on earth. Go, therefore, he's talking to us, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded. And remember what? I am with you always to the end of the age. Let us pray. God, we so much want to know more about you and be able to relate with you and not live in fear, but to live an exciting, wholesome life with you by our side. Helping with the struggles of each day and looking forward to the glory of heaven. In Jesus' name, amen.